Thank you for joining us today. It is a beautiful day. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. It is great to see you with us as we continue our Jericho series talking about being courageous in our life for the Lord. Now, um, coming back this week, I had a chance to be one of the leaders on our beach camp with our senior high, and what a time we had um, down there in Myrtle Beach at the convention center there. We had awesome preaching, and, and it was one of the things that encouraged my heart so much was seeing our group. We had a really large group, but there were well over a thousand teenagers in the building, and watching them run to the stage for worship. What, what a cool thing. They would run up and gather around the stage and they'd see them singing to the Lord. In fact, our group, one of the guys jumped on the stage and took a picture of our group from the stage. And, and that's where we, we get this. And uh, if you were on the trip, teens, it was great. And we had an awesome time. And we saw a young lady come to know Jesus Christ as her personal savior on the trip. Amen. That's what it was all about. And not only that. Many of our senior hours are excited about an awesome summer, a Bible study, things like that. They're, they're going well. But one of the things that was a, a subject of conversation is our conference um, had somebody on stage that I guess was social media popular. Now, I didn't know this because um, I, I'm not 17 anymore, but uh, it was getting around the group kind of whispers and giggles that they got their picture taken with this person. I'm like, what's going on with this? And so I, I went and asked my daughter, who was on the trip as, as one of the leaders, and um, what he's a dad, he's a, a social media influencer. I'm like, an influencer? This is a new term for me. Influencer. Yeah, yeah, and social media influencers. They, they're on social media, and they take pictures of themselves and show different things, and people are influenced by it, and they buy what they talk about. They live like they live. They, they see some of these things. And, and, and you, you know, many of the seniors in the room, you can associate with this, right? No, no, that's not true, but influencers. And I, and I got to thinking, in a room of some thousand teenagers, how many influencers do they have in their lives? You see, if you're a young parent here today, you are their primary influencer, but until you've raised teenagers, despite what you think, and I was one of those dads, not my, I was one of them, okay? You learn. They grow up and they're individuals and they're God's kids, not yours, and you see God work in their lives in different ways that are sometimes outside of even what you would have liked to have seen, and sometimes it exceeds all your expectations as well. And, and so in the life of teenagers and even college students, if you're a parent today, they have a lot of influences in their life. And, and one of our goals should always be as parents to have influencers in their life that are influencing them for good, not necessarily for bad. And so I'm not talking about an influencer on social, that's fine, what, whatever. But in our households, in our neighborhoods, how many fathers, since it's Father's Day, let's leverage this, how many fathers in the neighborhoods are really praying about and thinking through the influences on their family? What is speaking into their lives? What are they hoping to be like? Who are they following and seeking to look like, talk like, be like, buy like, act like, succeed like, whatever? Because when they're little, you are one of their major influencers. But as they get older, oftentimes how you've parented, how you've led, how you've worked that relationship, circumstances, you may not be very influential in their lives at all anymore. And so you're here today, and my goal here on Father's Day was to just kind of browbeat us all dads and make us crawl out of here feeling like losers. <laughs> no, no, that's not the goal. So don't worry about that. My goal is today to inspire us to do something that God would honor. Whether you still have influence, ooh, take this information and leverage it. If you've lost influence, use some of this to gain it back. Because who doesn't want to have a positive influence in the lives of the people we love. But how many dads in the neighborhoods are thinking, how can I get my family to follow me again or follow me into the future? But I'm gonna ask, is that really the best question spiritual leaders in our lives should be asking? How do I get people to follow me? Or is there a better question? 
And it's a question we're gonna navigate today and what we're gonna call the wall of influence or the wall of lost influence and how to knock through to those people we love and care about with the things of God. And so we'll be in Jericho today. We'll be talking about that. And there's many influences I know we can learn from. I hope to learn from Joshua. You've, you've seen influencers in scripture. Uh, you might have seen a post like this. It says, pray like Nehemiah, obey like Daniel, lead like Moses, serve like Martha, believe like Mary, fight like David, educate like Paul, build like Noah, love like Jesus. But, but we're in Joshua. What would that one be? Hmm. Today, I want you to leave not wondering what we could use for there. We're going to learn something from Joshua about leadership, about influence, and about taking a moment and seizing it for the glory of God. Whether you have influence, would hope to have more influence, or have lost your influence, I pray this wall today will be something we can knock down as we continue our series, Jericho Walls, the wall of influence. Heavenly Father, use your word today to inspire us, to encourage us, to convict us, and most importantly, Lord, to renew us. May we walk out of here with renewed minds because we visited the words of Scripture today, your wonderful words. And may we hear from you. And Lord, I ask that you remove all distraction from this place that we might focus on what you have for us, that we would be influencers of spiritual living. And we pray this in your name. Amen. You know, um, when you get to a certain age, you start asking questions. Now, now um, it happened to me back in specifically the year 2017. I, I, had, I had turned uh, an age in my life, and, and I was getting into that environment. 2015, I remember it specifically hitting me because that was, that was when I started seeing fours in front of my number. See, in the threes, I still enjoyed a lot of Buffalo Wild Wings. In the fours, not so much, but I still enjoy them. But you start asking different questions. You know, when you're younger, you'll, you can ask a group of middle schoolers, what do you want to be when they grow up? And they got all sorts of dreams of grandeur, Okay. By the time they got to college, they got all sorts of opinions of grandeur. But the time you hit your 30s, you start getting some reality checks on what's really going to happen or not. And, and, and as you start to work through that, you start to ask different questions. And, and as I got into that four, I started reaching out to some people in my life because things were starting to come my way that were different. And I was starting to ask, do I really want to be a pastor my entire life? Or is this something that I can maybe go this direction? I have this job opportunity, I have this. And I was just really searching in 2015 specifically, I can remember this. And I was reaching out to different people going, you know, I have this opportunity. I want to, I'm praying about this. I'm, I'm seeking this. I'm asking God this. And I'm talking to this guy. I'm just leaving my heart at this. That, this happens to me at breakfast, usually at restaurants. I'm just leaving leaving my heart on, on this mentor of mine. And he's just drawing on his napkin. I mean, I'm dumping on him. I'm giving him everything I got. I'm emotional and he's drawing on his napkin. I mean, I'm in a midlife crisis and this guy's drawing. And then he slid the napkin across to me and I began to realize that this napkin is what I'm talking about. He goes, Chris, he goes, I, I had this illustration given to me. I want to I give it to you. And since he and I both learn in pictures, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing this. And he goes, he's got zero, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. He said, most of us are going to live around 80 years. If you get OT, fine. But most of us are going to live around 80 years. And he goes, and you know what American Dream teaches us? Right around 24, 25, you get a job and you work till you're about 68 or 70. And in that time, you try to make as much money as you can so that you have all the money you want when you really don't want to go anywhere and you just want to stay home. <laughs> okay, I mean, and then you die and then whatever, okay? What, what, I mean, and, and we're, we get sold on this thing, don't we? I mean, we buy in hook, line, and sinker. But he, he, he did all these dots. He said, I want you to look at this. This is all the time. Look at your lifespan. Look how much time you're going to be working. I would really suggest you make sure you do something that's not to be successful. He goes, because Chris, right around this 50 number, you ask another question. It's not even whether you're asking whether you're successful anymore. 
Because men do this. Men will go over this word a lot. He goes, it, you start asking yourself, am I significant? Not am I successful, am I significant? Did I do something of significance? He goes, so let's say you're sitting right here at 40, and I was. He goes, what do you believe God would want you to do that would leave something significant? And I was processed, I just really feel like the Lord's leading me to start something, especially like an off-campus ministry for a church. I just feel led that it, we don't wanna make it just about the pulpit ministry, we wanna be serving our community and serving other people that Jesus wouldn't just come and put up walls and sit in one place, he'd be all over the place, I'm all getting passionate. He goes, but just remember, Chris, when you're doing all these things, that you've been given a race by God. All of us have races. And some of the races go for a season and then they're over and then we get another race. Paul tells us to run that race of the Christian life as to win, be focused, going towards the significance of the upward call of Christ, not the success that fleets during this life we live. Make sure you run that race. He goes, you've been given a race and they've got three names and you're married to another one, right? I said, yeah. He goes, don't forget that race. Don't forget that race. And that had stuck with me. And if you're a little bit closer to me, you know I like to build out dynamics, I call them, because I, I get to do, God sometimes blesses me out there doing do leadership coaching in different conferences, environments. And so I build out these dynamics and I build a dynamic around that napkin. I get inspiration from anywhere. And I said, this is the way I wanna, I wanna parent the best I can. And we're gonna call it starting block dynamics. That this is the way I wanted to, to take parenting and say, I, I wanna treat parenting like a starting block. My goal is not for them to stay, but to launch into what God has them. And so how can I be a spiritual influencer, whether you're a dad today or a mom, teenager, senior saint, how can I be a spiritual influence in someone's life? so they can launch into what God has for them. And in order to do that, you're gonna to have to follow some starting block dynamics. Have you ever seen a starting block? I wonder if I have one here in my prop closet. Oh, I do, look at that, look at that. What are the chances of an entire starting block being here? Now, now let me bring it over here. I'm gonna set it up. Some of you are very familiar with this. Um, my wife and I get these out to go on our walks together. We get... <laughs> no, you don't do that. Um, there's three commands at every starting block, and you're familiar with them, you've got them memorized. I promise you, you do. But there's three commands, and they, and they kind of umbrella an encouragement command, then there's a command, it's more of an exhortation, that's a, that's a big biblical word that means, that means follow this specifically, like a command from scripture, exhortation, I command you to do it this way. And then the last aspect is kind of a charge, to do something, and so I'll speak in track forms, uh, an encouragement, an exhortation, and a charge, okay? It goes something like this. On your mark, and you'll watch. Now, my, my daughter runs track in college, so I got to go to a couple track meets this year, and one specifically was a really cool one at Gettysburg College. A lot of track athletes from all over the place had gathered there, and, and you see them pacing around. Oh man, these high level athletes, they just pacing around the block. They come back, they got their AirPods on, or some just went with huge muffins on their ears. They don't want to hear anything, and they're walking around. And I said to my daughter, What are y'all thinking about right there? Um, you're, you're thinking about what you want to do. Like you have like this memorable language in your head. I want to keep my arms straight. I want to make sure I explode out. I said, so you're doing a lot of talking to yourself. Yeah, you got to stay positive. You're working on this. You've already sized up your competition and then you're waiting. Then the headphones come off. It's getting close. And then you hear on your mark and you'll even hear the coaches yelling out. All right, you got this. You remember what we talked about. You hear a lot of words. Remember, remember, remember on your mark. And they go in, they go in. They kind of just start setting their feet up like this. And they get in there on your mark. Sometimes they've got a teammate standing on the back block and so it doesn't slip. And, and on your mark, sometimes that teammate's like <laughs> whispering stuff I can't even hear. I'm trying to listen in because I know I got a sermon coming up. <laughs> and then they get their hands real focused like this and they go, on your mark. These all these high level athletes like, get set and they go up. And, and I asked my daughter, what do you do here? She goes, get your butt as high as you can because your goal is to stay as low as you can when you come out of the block. You don't want to stand up right when you stay low. 
And I said, I want to sound experienced on Sunday, okay. All right, so you get like this, and this is my wife and I, we go on walks. I say, ready to back up? On your mark, it's that. No, we don't do that. See, we don't live this way, so we got to learn. On your mark, encouragement, stay focused, stay focused. Get set. Now it's like a presentation. You're up, you're ready, and you don't want to jump the gun because you're disqualified. You don't want to do it wrong because then you're disqualified. Even the apostle Paul says, I run my race the way God's called me to run it so that I don't get disqualified. So this is an exhortation. The first thing, on your mark, it's encouragement. Now I'm in exhortation. Get set. And then the charge, right? Go. And you all want me to explode out. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're got, we got to think about our hamstrings, man. I also gotta think if I'll be panting while I'm preaching. And then the other thing I gotta think about is my microphone falling out. So you saw me charge out mentally. On your mark, encourage, get set, exhort, charge, go. Spiritual influencers, on your mark, get set, go. When do you need this? When God's calling you to leave where you're at and to get where he wants you to go. And you don't know exactly what's going to happen in this race. But God is leaving, no doubt in your mind, on your mark. Um, okay, okay, on your mark, on your mark. She said, we're pregnant. Um, okay. Um, we're pregnant. Um, okay, Lord, we've only been married two years. I don't know if it gets set. Oh dear. It's May. It's May. Get set. I said, wait, wait, time. Uh, go. Right. Cause that's sometimes the way the Lord works. I have said sometimes to God, could I run a few things by you first to get comfortable? On your mark, okay, I'm going, get set. And I'll tell you what, a life worth living is a life that gets mark and gets set and goes, doesn't fight with God. That's the life worth living. And the enemy's gonna do everything he can to scare you from launching into what God has for you. I promise you that. Young people, if I can give any encouragement, the things where God has used, what God has used the most in my life are the things that were the scariest for me to do. In fact, I'm currently going through one, and uh, I think we put September 1st on it. These are things that scare you, they make you nervous, but you know God is telling you to do it. On your mark, get set, go. Joshua finds himself beside the Jordan River. 40 years earlier, he and Caleb said, let's go. The crowd said, let's not go. They were disciplined for it, wandered for 40 years. They're right back at the spot on the Jordan River. Across the river is the city of Jericho sitting inside the promised land that God has promised for them, but they have to go claim it. That Jordan River, crossing it represents freedom from the slavery and bondage they've been in Egypt. Crossing that Jordan represents fulfillment for the promise that began long before Joshua with Moses. Crossing that Jordan meant a step of faith that whether they were ready or not, what God was calling them to do. And I don't know if you found this to be true in your life, but I love this quote. It says this, everything you want is on the other side of fear. Have you ever noticed that? It's as if the enemy knows that this would probably be good for your marriage, good for your life, good for your family, good for your coming relationship or something. He puts up these blocks of fear on your mark. You know, God, I was thinking, you know, I'm not quite ready. I'm not feeling it. Get set. I'm, I'm really not. I'm really not. Because if you launch into that, we might see God do something in your life so magnificent, so special, so wonderful. But the enemy will do everything he can to keep you off the block. And that's where spiritual influencers come in and go, I'm going to be with you. Come on, on your mark. Remember, remember what the Lord taught you. Get set. This is the scripture. Stay with it. Go. Because spiritual influencers want to see young people launch. It's one of my passions in life is the next generation launches into a life of faith despite every 
lie this world pours at them. On your mark, they're at the Jordan. On your mark. Look what scripture says. It's in Joshua. It's in chapter three. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Shittim and they came to the Jordan and all the people of Israel lodged there before they passed over. They're lodging on the very place they're about to pass over. And at the end of the three days, the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from the place and follow it. Okay, okay, okay. So Joshua's not leading. It looks like the Ark is gonna lead. Okay, let's keep reading. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. So about a half a mile, I want you to stay back from this ark. So if you're walking down Fifth Street, keep it around the Dunkin' Donuts, kinda. You stay back from this thing. What's so special about this ark? Stay with me. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go. For you have not passed this way before. Oh, I love that. You know, my heavenly father, he loves me. And he knows when he's calling me to do something I haven't done before. And therefore it's very imperative that I don't lead, but that the heavenly father leads. Then Joshua said to the people, I want you to consecrate yourselves tomorrow. For tomorrow, excuse me, the Lord will do wonders among you. You can go to bed tonight. We're here on the side of the Jordan, but get up because God is going to do wonders on your mark. Wonders on your mark. You see, they, they often would travel and they'd set up the tabernacle in the middle of them. And inside that tabernacle, they had a gate and there was called the tent of meeting. And the tent of meeting was a place that only the priests could go. Because inside the tent of meeting was a holy place and it was inside there that the Holy of Holies housed what was called the Ark of the Covenant. And this Ark of the Covenant was amazing. It was gorgeous, it was astonishing, and it was symbolic as well as the place that God dwelt. You see, the Ark was told to build it a certain way. The Ark was built of uh, Acadia wood. Okay, and so this wood was about two and a half cubits wide by about one and a half cubits in depth. And then they were told to overlay and cover it with gold, gorgeous gold, and then put a rim around it and, and keep it in this beautiful boxed shape. And then God instructed them specifically to put rings on the side of this, golden rings, because these golden rings would house two wood poles that they were to overlay with gold as well. And then these poles would go inside the rings. And that's important because the priests would carry the Ark of the Covenant. It's going to move. And they would carry it and not be able to touch it. For if they touched it, they would die. This thing was holy. But what was so special about the Ark of the Covenant was the top. The top was the mercy seat. The mercy seat was the place where the high priest would come in and sprinkle the blood of the sacrificial lamb to forgive the sins of the people. It was a foreshadowing of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so over top of the mercy seat were two cherubim with angel's wings pointing at one another. This was the Ark of the Covenant. It not only was the presence of God in this time, but it serves and still shows the, the body or embodies God going with them, not now in a fire by night or a cloud by day, but an ark that would go in front of them and they would follow it. You say, man, they never taught me that on Indiana Jones. That's good stuff. <laughs> on your mark. Get the ark. Tomorrow, God will do wonders among you. This was the on your mark moment of this. It was a visual. It's as if Joshua in his leadership said, I want the people at the blocks. I want them at the blocks the night before. I want them mentally ready. Consecrate yourself means to abstain from all intimacy, to wash your clothes, to make sure you're prayed up and ready to go, because tomorrow, God's gonna do wonders. 
There are, there are many different environments in life where you say, go feel out the moment. I know there's been specific facilities we've prayed for as a church leadership where we've had men and women parking in the parking lot and just praying, sitting in the facility or at the facility. They were doing, I did that for my own home when I bought my house. I'd go there. The, the neighbors that were moving were probably wondering, who is this guy coming and praying in the driveway? So I tried to hide down behind the tree when I do it, but I just wanted to be there. There's coaches who leverage this and say, hey, we're gonna be in the moment. It was, it was in 2016, um, I had the privilege, I, I coached little league teams and, and I had the privilege of being a part of uh, some travel teams for baseball in the Penridge area here. And um, it, it was a lot. We were doing different stuff all over summer, but our 2016 team was really special. And we got really far and we advanced the states and, and did a great job. And, and, and it was tiring, it was exhausting, especially with ministry going on. And I was going through that same season of life of whether I should keep coaching, I've got this going on, this going on. And I brought that up with the napkin man too. And he said, Chris, the race, he's not gonna be playing baseball forever. Just maybe you stay in this race for now, trust me. All right, I'll coach one more year. Well, the team did great again. And you normally take about 14 to 15 kids on these travel teams into their, into their state playoffs and stuff, but we were down to 10 kids. Different things that happened and injuries and stuff like this. We we're down to 10, but they still advanced. And when we got there, we got them shirts that said unfinished business, okay? And, and on top of that, when we got there night one, our coach said, we're all going to the field. We go, we don't have a game tonight. We're going to the field and we're gonna sit up on the left field. There At left field is kind of like Fenway at left field. At state championship, they had all these tables so the kids could sit up and look over the field. We're going up on left field. And we're gonna picture ourselves winning this championship this year. We're gonna go to the place. So this is, sounds great, you know? So we went and we ate our burgers and looked over the field and imagined ourselves jumping around as champions on that field. And I'm, a, I'm kind of a journaler, and so I took a picture of it, okay? So, so here we are sitting there on Friday night overlooking the stage, and we're gonna win this thing, right? We got our Penridge shirts on, we're all excited and stuff. And, and we did, we actually did win the thing. And I remember taking this picture in front of them on Sunday of being state champions. And I remember thinking about Napkin Man. I almost didn't do this. I almost walked away from this because of this, 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 and his reminder that one of your races is being there. You want to be there. And I'm so grateful for that wisdom. On your mark, dad, is there anything that maybe God's whispering in your ear through another brother in Christ, maybe, or even your wife. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. On your mark, get set. Get set. It's the morning. The sun comes up and Joshua goes out into the camp. He says to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass before the people. And so they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went before the people. What's going on? We got, we got the Ark of the Covenant. You're gonna have to just visualize it for me. I've got, I'm holding the post, all right? Okay, the priests go and get, only the priests could carry it. And the Ark of the Covenant starts moving out. But wait a minute, I didn't hear God tell Joshua to do any of this. Joshua is such an influence over these folks. They're following him. He's being strong and courageous on your mark. He's got him by the side. We're going through on your, get set, get the ark and head forward. And, and he makes this step. And then we hear from God. Then the Lord said to Joshua, today I will be exalted. You, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Oh, if you're putting two and two together, you're almost anticipating God's gonna break these waters apart, isn't he? You're starting to put two and two together as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. But did you notice something? Joshua goes up to the edge of the water. He camps the people there on your mark. He gets up in the morning he tells them to go get the Ark of the Covenant and start heading out. And then God speaks. I don't know if you've noticed this in your life, but I have seen most of the time, God asks me to take the step that he knows that I know he wants me to do. Take that step and then I'll show you. 
Take the step and then you'll get your next step. I'm gonna exalt you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. Let me read them to you. It's in verses nine through 13. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of your God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will not fail to drive out from before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gergesites, Amorites, Jebusites, lots of ites, lots of ites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of the earth is passing before you into the Jordan. Now therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe, and when the soles of their feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap." You are about to see God do mighty things. Get set. Get set. I can still remember a time in my life where I felt God leading me to do something from that napkin man conversation. And that was to look for a place where we could do ministry off our campus. And we had done a lot of searching and I was looking for an athletic facility, but the Lord kept sending me cooks. And before you know it, the Lord had guided us to a place on Ridge Road. And it was so clear, it was an on your mark and get set. But the get set was a presentation. It's one thing to talk about an idea. It's one thing to say you're gonna start a business. It's one thing to even take notes in your, in your little note sheets. It's another to do it and to tell people you're going to do it, right? The get set moment can sometimes be pretty, pretty nerve wracking. And so I wanted to put together a drawing And I had kind of dabbled with architecture from time to time. And so I wanted to put together a drawing and a rendering that would uh, kind of look cool. And so I was messing with it and doing it. And and it was a picture of what I was hoping the ridge would look like. And I still have that image. And and here it is. Um, And and don't don't judge it. I was just doing my best, cutting and pasting. I do understand there's people dangling in midair. And and, uh, some of the trees are, are I I get all that. Um, But my goal was to kind of present, and and I could remember thinking, you know, in my head, I can't wait for the day where they kind of put the sign on the side of the building and we we get set and we follow God into this uncertain future. And so I presented that, and yes, we didn't do the stone veneer on the side. I was a little excited, okay? So don't don't overjudge that. But, But it was a moment that I wanted to present it, the get set. And I needed that for those times in my life when you were gonna have naysay, you get discouraged, you have different things, you have overexcited people, all different things, I wanted that for it. And I'll tell you what, that moment, I didn't know all the challenges that were gonna go ahead, but we took that step as leaders and God started to reveal himself in ways we couldn't even believe. And before you know it, I got the call, hey Chris, drive up Market Street. They're putting a sign on the side of the building. And we're driving up Market Street and I get to see this whole thing going on there. And now to see we're celebrating its fifth year anniversary this fall of what God has done at Revivals. Over 20 some thousand meals have been given out for free. We've been able to do back to school haircuts. We've had pop-up block party trailers. We have a relief truck ministry starting up. We're taking food to people who are homebound. We are getting calls from our community saying, could you help this situation? That's it. We've cleaned up Penridge Little League fields. Helped. We've even cleaned up dog parks, okay? We've done all sorts of neat things at Revivals to do a ministry, but I learned something through that whole thing. The first step to going anywhere is decide not to stay where you are. It's not my quote, but I want you to feel that. Who needs that? The the first step to going anywhere is to decide we're not staying here. And even if it's scary, even if it's hard, this isn't where we're going to stay. A spiritual influencer here is on your mark. Get set. And, And you think it's go, right? 
But I learned something from this Joshua story. It's not on your mark, get set, go. It's actually on your mark, get set, follow. Dad, you want to be a spiritual influencer? On your mark, get set, follow. Wait, 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 that, that, that felt like I took a little pressure off of me. Yeah, that's the point. I, I think everybody's supposed to follow me. They're supposed to follow you following God. On your mark, get set, follow. And as soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of water for the Jordan overflows all its banks through the time of harvest. Oh my word, are you kidding me? This is the time of harvest? This is the time of flooding? This is the time where the river's overflowing? If you go to Jordan today, it's not that impressive a river, partly because it's running, scholars say, at only about 20% of what it used to because of the fords and the canals and the different things that have been built into it. But see, back then, it was running much wider, and on top of that, it was flood season. It was overflowing its banks. I've gone tubing down the Delaware after high rains. It's fast. It's not like, oh, just swim over to the side. If you don't plan to swim over to your side, you're going to miss your place. The Jordan is flowing super hard, and when all the people came out of their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, do you know what happened? Scripture says this. Let, let's pull up some geography. You go, wait a minute. These, are, these aren't just myths from the past? No, no. These are biblical accounts. So let's pull up a map. The waters coming down from above stood up and rose in a heap far away at Adam. So north of the Jordan, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the seat of Arabah, the salt sea, were completely cut off. So it seems, I always had it pictured that the water was standing up right here, but it's back up here. The water just dries up and they go across and they take that step of faith. You know, I normally like to use free images and, and as much as possible, but I saw an image. I said, I got to buy that image. It's so good because I want it somewhere in my office or something. And I want to put on it the dynamic on your mark, get set follow. Look at this image. I love it. Those priests taking it out and standing in the water and watching God just dry it up and the Israelites go across. I wonder if they were looking up river. Keep walking. They stood still. Pray like Nehemiah. Obey like Daniel. Lead like Moses. Serve like Martha, believe like Mary, fight like David, educate like Paul, build like Noah, love like Jesus. But hey, why don't we follow like Joshua? I don't know if this is true in your life, but I have noticed that God seldom gives the next step until I've taken the first step. I got to walk on a beach this week. I got to see from time to time people leaving footprints in the sand. I remember one time seeing a father walking on the beach, not so much this week, but I saw a father just walking along and behind him was a little toddler. And that little toddler was following dad's footprints. But you know what he was doing? He was trying to land in them. And so he'd go, he had to jump because dad's pace was bigger than his. And so he'd be jumping and you'd see dad's walking and then little footprints inside the big footprints. It's as if dad was leaving the trail for the little boy to follow. You see, throughout our neighborhoods, there might be a lot of fathers here today going, I've lost my influence. How do I get my family to follow me again? But I think we're asking the wrong question. I think the best question we could be asking is, how do I get my family to follow Christ? Not me. It's not about me. It's not about dad. It's not even about mom. It's about Christ. Even in my own failures, may I point to Christ. You see, that's the way to break down the wall of lost influence. You break it down by following Christ, not demanding an audience.
You break it down by obeying God's commands, not by forcing God's command. You, you break it down by showing God's righteousness, not by condemning and hurt. The wall of influence. I told you I'd like to give you seven marks of an influential spiritual leader. You want to be a spiritual influencer? Here's seven marks that I've tried to leverage in my own life for the times when I fail and when I'm not perfect. And they're not going to be Chris's. If you're, if you're like, I don't need Chris's, you're right, you don't need mine. They're going to be the Apostle Paul's from 1 Thessalonians. They're going to be his seven marks of being a spiritual influencer that he wanted to give to the church in Thessalonica. It's beautiful. I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going to point out the seven. And whether you have influence, oh, leverage these, keep leveraging these. And if you feel you lost influence, maybe I'll give you a couple of tips on how to get it back that the enemy isn't want you to hear. It begins in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul says this to the church. We give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering before God and the Father and your work of faith, of labor, and love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with joy from the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers of Macedonia. Would you like to be a spiritual influencer? The world needs more of them. And I'm not talking about just going, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a child of God who influences people to live for Christ. Here's your first step. A spiritual leader, a spiritual influencer is grateful in prayer. You can be a Christian and complain the rest of your life. But if you want to be a spiritual influencer, live a life of gratitude, especially in your prayer life. You know, the enemy wants to trick people in leadership positions to complain about the people that follow them. But one of the most gravitating aspects of a leader is a leader who is grateful for what God has given him. How do you do this? Dads, pray grateful prayers out loud. If you still get to tuck kids in, when you tuck them in, dear Jesus, thank you for my boy. Thank you for his awesome smile. Do you know what you're doing in that moment? You are showing your son a spiritual gratitude in prayer. We are so tempted to complain about the things we point out. But moms and dads, newsflash, you have flaws too. Let's choose to be grateful for the people around us and you will increase your influence into their lives spiritually. You say, Chris, I've done a lot of complaining. I've lost this area of influence. Start over. What? If you got a pulse, you still have a purpose. You get a dead or dead at father's lunch today, okay? You start out, hey guys, I want to pray for everybody. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this child and that. And they'll be like, dad, you were so long in that prayer. Go ahead. Annoy him. Tell him how grateful you are for him. You will increase or gain back your influence. Young people do not want to hear all their negativity all the time. Everybody knows they make mistakes. Be grateful. I'm going to go quicker now because it goes to chapter 2. There's six more. Paul says this, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated in Philippi, as you know, we have boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. You want to be a spiritual influencer? You can be a Christian and never talk about Jesus. It does happen. I know that it, fear sometimes can grip us, but if you want to be a spiritual influence, there's boldness in God. I'm not saying necessarily boldness in your certain conviction or your political or whatever. Boldness in God. When a little boy goes to a hospital room and hears his 70-year-old grandpa say to the nurse, if it weren't for the grace of God, I'd be so scared right now, but this surgery... It doesn't scare me because I know Jesus is with me. That little boy hears his grandpa say that and says, 
my grandpa is not ashamed of the gospel of God. And that little boy that hears a grandpa say that might even someday grow up and become a pastor, hypothetically speaking. You want to be a spiritual influencer? Don't be ashamed of the gospel of God. For it's easy to be, especially in our day and age, to be ashamed. The devil wants you to be. A spiritual influence is not a shame. You say, Chris, we don't talk about God so much in our family. Start today. Start today. Hey, I want to tell you guys about a verse that the Lord has been laying on my heart before we pray for dinner tonight. I want to tell you about a verse. Son, let's go get some wings. I want to tell you what Jesus has been doing in my life. Third, For appeal did not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests ourselves. Third aspect, you want to be a spiritual influencer? Honorable in speech. For our appeal did not come from impurity. You can be a child of God and have a horrible mouth. It could be full of corrupt communication, complaining, belittling, demeaning. You can have that. It's our flesh patterns sometimes creep up, but you want to be a spiritual influencer? Guard your mouth. Be honorable in speech. For often the things you say will dictate whether people want to hear anything else from you. Spiritual influencers, Paul says, our appeal did not come from any impurity. They are honorable in their speech. What an incredible influence you could have by just rethinking how you speak. See, none of these things take any kind of talent and you can win the right back. Maybe you say you blew it, dad. You've lost this in your son's life or your daughter's life. Sometimes it goes like this. Hey, bud, the other day after you struck out three straight times and got in the car, I said a few things. And I was wrong. Dad was wrong. I was, I was mad. I was upset. I was upset for you. I was upset. I'm upset. And I, and I need forgiveness for the way I talked to you after that game. Tomorrow's game. If you strike out three times, we're going to get an ice cream. Try to get a hit, though. Please, try to get it. Honorable in speech. For we never came with words of flattery. As you know, we're pretext of good. God is witness. Nor did we seek the glory from men, whether from you or for others, though we could have selflessness in agenda. You want to have influence in somebody? Have selflessness in your agenda. It's not for me. Don't make it about me. I remember being a youth pastor going, hey, teens, could we please not talk while I'm speaking? Not because I need your respect, but because I think he deserves it. Amen? And they all went, amen. Because I don't deserve it, but he does. It was a selflessness. I've also made the own mistake myself. He continues and says, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you have become so dear to us. Gentle in approach. Gentle in approach. You want to be a spiritual influencer? Gentleness. I can't tell you how many times I've had young people share with me the times when I was a youth pastor that stood out to them where their spiritual leaders weren't gentle. But think about times where you could be gentle in your approach. One of the coolest guys in our church, super big guy, he's burly guy, he works landscape. All right, he's in his 60s now. He still works. He's still grinding away. But he cries when he holds his little grandchildren. You see tears coming down his eyes. It's like, that's one of the biggest studs I know. And he holds those kids. Those kids have no chance of getting hurt in his arms. They like swallows them up. Just look at us so cute. It's like, really? It's awesome. Spiritual influencers are gentle in their approach, Apostle Paul says. Two more. For you remember, brothers, our labor. We toil day and night not to be a burden to any of you while we proclaim the gospel of God. You want to be a spiritual influencer? Diligent in your responsibilities. When you work hard, you have an influence. You're not working for men. You're working for the Lord. My wife, who has an incredible work ethic that I get to watch, she has had this her entire life. She says, I got it from my dad. He punched a clock in the morning and he punched a clock at night. He didn't complain. He did his job and he worked hard for the Lord. He was a factory worker. There were no stage and lights, but he went to work and he showed all us girls how to work. 
Apostle Paul said, I did that when I was among you, First Thessalonians, so you'd see it diligent with my responsibilities. You might have said, I might not be diligent, but here's a chance for you to say, that's not gonna happen anymore. I wanna win back some influence by being diligent in my responsibilities. It's very hard to respect a lazy person. The Psalms, excuse me, the Proverbs tell us all about it. Go by the house of the sluggard and learn. Paul says, we work diligently among you. And it was part of being a spiritual influence. For the men? No, for the Lord. And then finally, authentic in conduct. You are witnesses and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how we lived among you. And he drops this bomb. He says this, for you know, like a father with his children, we exhorted on your mark, encouraged, get set, and charged. Go. And they tell the track athletes, explode out. You take the one leg and you explode that forward and you move your other hands at the same time you explode out. Charge to walk successfully. No, to live with significance in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. His whole emphasis of being a spiritual influencer was built on the illustration of a father who exhorts, encourages, and charges. The threefold command on your mark, get set, go. I want to launch you into the future that God has for you by giving you a launching pad of spiritual influence. That was Paul's goal with Timothy. It was Paul's goal throughout his writings to be an influencer. Look at these seven. Grateful in prayer. Boldness in God, honorable in speech, selfless in agenda, gentle in approach, diligent in responsibility, and authentic in conduct. Pray like Nehemiah, obey like Daniel, lead like Moses, serve like Martha, believe like Mary, fight like David, educate like Paul, build like Noah, love like Jesus. Follow like that. Dad, it's hard. I think being a dad is one of my toughest jobs and it's my favorite job. I get so frustrated with myself when I mess up. And I can look back sometimes and it's like the enemy reminds me 11 o'clock at night sometimes of what I didn't do and I feel like I wanna run up and wake him up and fix everything. Hey, let me fix the last three years. So I journal it instead. Then I read it to him the next day and they're like, dad, it's okay, it's no big deal. No, I'm a mess. We are hard on ourselves and so families, any encouragement is well received because we're so hard on ourselves. But dads, it's not about them following you. It's about you following Jesus. I look at the life of Joshua and his footprints led right up to the edge of the beach and he went into the water dry. His footprints didn't go back and forth. I just don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know why God wouldn't say something by now. He's waiting for you to take the step. Okay, take the step on your mark. I just got a few things. Get set. Oh my word. This is what you have for me? If you want to be a spiritual influencer, I gave you seven. But I want you to know if you know Jesus Christ, your Savior, a little poem I want to close with that reminds us about footprints in the sand. It says this. Let it encourage you, especially if you're tired. One night I had a dream, a dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to me, and one belonging to the Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. And I noticed that many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This troubled me. So I asked the Lord about it. 
Lord, you said once I decided to follow you that you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when, when, when I needed you most, you would leave me. And he whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I was carrying you. Dad, if you know Jesus Christ as your savior, he's not only walking beside you, he's carrying you. And the enemy's gonna whisper in all your failures and all your mistakes. And he's gonna say things like, if they follow you, they're gonna destroy their lives. Let Jesus remind you, it's not about them following you. It's about them following me. Keep pointing them to me. When you fail, say you're sorry. When you make a mistake, let them know. When I give you joy, share it with them. It's about me. And for those times when you're exhausted, I got you and I'm carrying you through this. So no more looking at the past. That's what forgiveness is for. All the fathers in this room who know Jesus Christ is your savior on your mark, get set, follow. You've got years left of influence. It's not about being successful. It's about being significant. May your footprints, dad, walk up to the beach. And I pray for your families, all the footprints follow. And you cross that Jordan with all of them. I can't see that as possible. I can't see that ever happening, Chris. You don't even know. You really think it was possible for a river to dry up and a million people cross? The God of impossible is with you, child of God.